Hi everyone. On August 10, 1628, the Vasa ship was launched into Stockholm's harbour with great fanfare. However, almost immediately after its launch, disaster struck. A gust of wind caught the Vasa's sails, and the ship began to tilt precariously. Within minutes, water started pouring into the open gun ports, causing the ship to capsize and sink in shallow waters just a few hundred meters from the shore. Less than three days after the disaster, a contract was signed for the ship to be raised. However, those efforts were unsuccessful. The earliest attempts at raising Vesa by English engineer Ian Bulmer, resulted in righting the ship but also got it more securely stuck in the mud, which was one of the biggest impediments to the earliest attempts at recovery. Salvaging technology in the early 17th century was much more primitive than today, but the recovery of ships used roughly the same principles as were used to raise Vesa more than 300 years later. Two ships or hulks were placed parallel to either side above the wreck, and ropes attached to several anchors were sent down and hooked to the ship. The two hulks were filled with as much water as was safe, the ropes tightened, and the water pumped out. The sunken ship then rose with the ships on the surface and could be towed to shallower waters. The process was then repeated until the entire ship was successfully raised above water level. Even if the underwater weight of Vesa was not great, the mud in which it had settled made it sit more securely on the bottom and required considerable lifting power to overcome. More than 30 years after the ship's sinking, in 1663 to 1665, Albrecht von Trelleben and Andreas Speckel mounted an effort to recover the valuable guns. With a simple diving bell, the team of Swedish and Finnish divers retrieved more than 50 of them. Such activity waned when it became clear that the ship could not be raised by the technology of the time. However, Vesa did not fall completely into obscurity after the recovery of the guns. The ship was mentioned in several histories of Sweden and the Swedish Navy, and the location of the wreck appeared on harbour charts of Stockholm in the 19th century. In 1844, the Navy officer Anton Ludwig van Helm turned in a request for salvaging rights to the ship, claiming he had located it. Van Helm was an inventor who designed an early form of light diving suit and had previously been involved in other salvage operations. There were dives made on the wreck in 1895 to 1896, and a commercial salvage company applied for a permit to raise or salvage the wreck in 1920 but this was turned down. In the early 1950s, amateur archaeologist Anders Fronzen considered the possibility of recovering wrecks from the cold brackish waters of the Baltic because, he reasoned, they were free from the shipworm Terry de Navalis, which usually destroys submerged wood rapidly in warmer, saltier seas. Fronzen had previously been successful in locating wrecks such as Rick Saplet and Leibskus Vaughan, and after long and tedious research he began looking for Vesa as well. He spent many years probing the waters without success around the many assumed locations of the wreckage. He did not succeed until, based on accounts of an unknown topographical anomaly just south of the Gustav V dock on Beckhoman, he narrowed his search. In 1956, with a homemade, gravity powered coring probe, he located a large wooden object almost parallel to the mouth of Dock on Beckholmen. The location of the ship received considerable attention, even if the identification of the ship could not be determined without closer investigation. Soon after the announcement of the find, planning got underway to determine how to excavate and raise Vesa. The Swedish Navy was involved from the start as were various museums and the National Heritage Board, representatives of which eventually formed the Vesa Committee, the predecessor of the Vesa Board. A number of possible recovery methods were proposed, including filling the ship with ping-pong balls and freezing it in a block of ice, but the method chosen by the Vesa Board was essentially the same one attempted immediately after the sinking. Divers spent two years digging six tunnels under the ship for steel cable slings, which were taken to a pair of lifting pontoons at the surface. 
The work under the ship was extremely dangerous, requiring the divers to cut tunnels through the clay with high-pressure water jets and suck up the resulting slurry with a dredge, all while working in total darkness with hundreds of tons of mud-filled ship overhead. A persisting risk was that the wreck could shift or settle deeper into the mud while a diver was working in a tunnel, trapping him underneath the wreckage. Despite the dangerous conditions, more than 1,300 dives were made in the salvage operation without any serious accidents. Each time the pontoons were pumped full, the cables tightened and the pontoons pumped out, the ship was brought a meter closer to the surface. In a series of 18 lifts in August and September 1959, the ship was moved from depth of 32 to 16 meters, 105 to 52 feet, in the more sheltered area of Kastelholmsviken, where divers could work more safely to prepare for the final lift. Over the course of a year and a half, a small team of commercial divers cleared debris and mud from the upper decks to lighten the ship, and made the hull as watertight as possible. The gun ports were closed by means of temporary lids, a temporary replacement of the collapsed stern castle was constructed, and many of the holes from the iron bolts that had rusted away were plugged. The final lift began on the 8th of April 1961, and on the morning of the 24th of April, Vesa was ready to return to the world for the first time in 333 years. Press from all over the world, television cameras, 400 invited guests on barges and boats, and thousands of spectators on shore watched as the first timbers broke the surface. The ship was then emptied of water and mud and towed to the Gustav V. Dry Dock on Beckhoman, where the ship was floated on its own keel onto a concrete pontoon, on which the hull still stands. From the end of 1961 to December 1988, Vesa was housed in a temporary facility called Wasavavit, which included exhibit space as well as the activities centered on the ship. A building was erected over the ship on its pontoon, but it was very cramped, making conservation work awkward. Visitors could view the ship from just two levels, and the maximum viewing distance was in most places only a couple of meters, which made it difficult for viewers to get an overall view of the ship. In 1981, the Swedish government decided that a permanent building was to be constructed, and a design competition was organized. The winning design, by the Swedish architects Månsson and Dahlbeck, called for a large hall over the ship in a polygonal, industrial style. The museum was officially opened to the public in 1990. They supposed an unprecedented challenge for archaeologists. Never before had a four-story structure, with most of its original contents largely undisturbed, been available for excavation. The conditions under which the team had to work added to the difficulties. The ship had to be kept wet in order that it not dry out and crack before it could be properly conserved. In order to establish find locations, the hull was divided into several sections demarcated by the many structural beams, the decking and by a line drawn along the center of the ship from stern to bow. For the most part, the decks were excavated individually, though at times work progressed on more than one deck level simultaneously. Vesa had four preserved decks, the upper and lower gun decks, the hold and the orlop. Because of the constraints of preparing the ship for conservation, the archaeologists had to work quickly, in 13-hour shifts during the first week of excavation. The upper gun deck was greatly disturbed by the various salvage projects between 1628 and 1961, and it contained not only material that had fallen down from the rigging and upper deck, but also more than three centuries of harbor refuse. The decks below were progressively less disturbed. The gun decks contained not just gun carriages, the three surviving cannons, and other objects of a military nature, but were also where most of the personal possessions of the sailors had been stored at the time of the sinking. These included a wide range of loose finds, as well as chests and casks with spare clothing and shoes, tools and materials for mending, money in the form of low denomination copper coins, privately purchased provisions, and all of the everyday objects needed for life at sea. 
most of the finds are of wood, testifying not only to the simple life on board, but to the generally unsophisticated state of Swedish material culture in the early 17th century. The lower decks were primarily used for storage, and so the hold was filled with barrels of provisions and gunpowder, coils of anchor cable, iron shot for the guns, and the personal possessions of some of the officers. On the all-up deck, a small compartment contained six of the ship's ten sails, rigging spares, and the working parts for the ship's pumps. Another compartment contained the possessions of the ship's carpenter, including a large tool chest. After the ship itself had been salvaged and excavated, the site of the loss was excavated thoroughly during 1963 to 1967. This produced many items of rigging tackle as well as structural timbers that had fallen off. Particularly from the beak head and stern castle. Most of the sculptures that had decorated the exterior of the hull were also found in the mud, along with the ship's anchors and the skeletons of at least four people. The last object to be brought up was the nearly 12 meter long, 39 feet long boat, called Esping in Swedish. Found lying parallel to the ship and believed to have been being towed by Vesa when it sank. Vesa has become a popular and widely recognized symbol for a historical narrative about the Swedish Stormaktstiden, the great power period in the 17th century, and about the early development of a European nation state. Within the disciplines of history and maritime archaeology, the wrecks of large warships from the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries have received particularly widespread attention as perceived symbols of past greatness of the state of Sweden. Among these wrecks, Vesa is the best known example, and has become recognized internationally, not least through intentional use of the ship as a symbol for marketing Sweden abroad. The name Vesa has in Sweden become synonymous with sunken vessels that are considered to be of great historical importance, and these are usually described, explained and valued in relation to Vesa itself. Vesa's unique status has drawn considerable attention and captured the imagination of more than two generations of scholars, tourists, model builders, and authors. Though historically unfounded, the popular perception of the building of the ship as a botched and disorganized affair has been used by many authors of management literature as an educational example of how not to organize a successful business. In the tender ship, Manhattan Project engineer Arthur Squires used the Vesa story as an opening illustration of his thesis that governments are usually incompetent managers of technology projects. The Vesa Museum has co-sponsored two versions of a documentary about the history and recovery of the ship both by documentary filmmaker Anders Volgren. In late 2011, a third Vesa film premiered on Swedish television, with a longer running time and a considerably larger budget. Several mass-produced model kits and countless custom-built models of the ship have been made. Vesa has inspired many works of art, including a gilded Disney-themed parody of the pilaster sculptures on the ship's quarter galleries. Vesa sank because it had very little initial stability, resistance to healing under the force of wind or waves acting on the hull. This was due to the distribution of mass in the hull structure, and to the ballast, guns, provisions, and other objects loaded on board placing a lot of weight too high in the ship. This put the center of gravity very high relative to the center of buoyancy, thus making the ship readily heal in response to little force, and not providing enough writing moment for it to become upright again. The reason for the high center of gravity was the hull construction. The part of the hull above the waterline was too high and too heavily built in relation to the amount of hull in the water. The headroom in the decks was higher than necessary for crewmen who were, on average, 1.67 meters, 5 feet 6 inches tall, making the weight of the decks and the guns higher than needed. In addition, the deck beams and their supporting timbers were overdimensioned and more closely spaced than required for the loads they carried, contributing too much weight to the already tall and heavy upper works. The guns weighed little over 60 tons, about 5% of the total displacement of the loaded ship, not enough in themselves to cause the ship to capsize.
During construction both Swedish feet, of 29.69 cm and Amsterdam feet, of 28.31 cm, were in use by different teams. Four rulers used by the workmen who built the ship have been found. The use of different units of length on the two sides of the vessel caused the ship to be heavier on the port side. In the last part of the inquest held after the sinking, a group of master shipwrights and senior naval officers were asked for their opinions about why the ships sank. Their discussion and conclusions show very clearly that they knew what had happened, and their verdict was summed up very clearly by one of the captains, who said that the ship did not have enough belly to carry the heavy upper works. Thanks for watching.